Yo, what's up guys? Alpha, and today I'm going to be doing a full in-depth deck breakdown of a deck that I've recently used to get rank 1 with on the Arena Ladder. And now before I get into it, there's going to be an MTGA zone link down in the description. If you click on that, it'll have the deck list there that you can just import into Arena if you want to try the deck out for yourself. Uh, anyway, with that all out of the way, this is my Naya Hardened Scales Enchantress deck in Historic. And as the name suggests, this is a deck that is built around a bunch of enchantment synergies, and it's also built around this card, Hardened Scales. So this is a one mana enchantment that says, if one or more plus one plus one counters we put on a creature we control, that many at plus one are put on instead so if an effect would put one plus one plus one counter on a creature we put two on instead if we have two of these in play we get to put three on instead if we have three of these in play we get to put four on instead so this is just a way for one mana which is very very cheap for us to grow our board insanely quickly if we have ways to put plus one plus one counters on creatures. So first of all the fact that this is an enchantment also means that it plays very well into all of our other enchantment synergies but we also have a bunch of ways in the deck to put plus, plus one plus one counters on other creatures that we control so the first one we or the first way we have of abusing that is with generous visitors. This is a one mana one one and whenever we cast an enchantment spell we get to put a plus one plus one counter on target creature so obviously we have a bunch of enchantments in the deck so we can start triggering this on turn two immediately and this is great because it allows us to grow our board in the early game which means that we can have some very aggressive starts against the slower decks it's also very good against other aggressive decks as well because it allows us to grow our creatures very fast to be able to block and stop them from getting in and the fact that it doesn't have to put plus one plus one plus one counters on itself means that we can spread them around so that our single creatures aren't as vulnerable to interaction as well so generous visitor very efficiently costed for what it's doing casting this on turn one into an enchantment on turn two you know potentially into a hardened scale so then we can start putting even more plus one plus one counters on creatures is really strong and enables some very aggressive starts from the deck, which is really great. And then second up, we've got a cami uh, four copies of Cameo of Transient. So this is a 2 minus 2 2 with Trample. And whenever we cast an enchantment spell, we put a plus one plus one counter on the Kami. And at the beginning of each end step, if an enchantment was put into the graveyard from our battlefield, we get to return it to our hand. So very similar to Generous Visitor. You know, as we cast enchantments, we're going to put loads of plus one plus one counters on it. If we have hardened scales or multiple copies of hardened scales in play, we get to put even more plus one plus one counters on it. The reason why this card specifically is so important in the deck is because of the trample. So, one of the downsides of Generous Visitor is if the opponent is playing a deck that has a bunch of chump blockers in it, you know, they can go wide and block our creatures, it can be difficult to attack through. Now, that is kind of mitigated by the fact that we can spread our plus one plus one counters around our creatures. We can make all of our creatures big, which makes it difficult for the opponent to block a wide board. But Cami of Transients having Trample is really huge because one of the great things about this deck is that it can have really insane combo-ish turns where we have hard scales in play, usually alongside a Sanctum Weaver and a bunch of enchantments that we can cast, or with the second or third chapter of Showdown of the Scales. And we can often put so many plus one plus one counters on Cami of Transients in one turn that we can turn it into a creature with above 20 power and just one shot the opponent out of nowhere. So the really strong thing about this deck, and Cami of Transients definitely enables this, is it has some very, very fast aggressive starts, which makes it great at pressuring against control and slower decks. But it also builds up a very big pro board presence, which means it can stabilize against other aggressive decks. We also have tons of ways to refuel that I'll get to in a minute, which means that if the game does go long, we can grind. And we also have a combo element to it as well. Like I said, if we have hardened scales or multiple copies of hardened scales in play, and we're getting plus one plus one counters off Showdown of the Scalds, or we just have a ton of mana off Sanctum Weaver alongside one of our Enchantress effects, we can grow Cami of Transients to like a 30 or 40 power creature in one turn and just attack for lethal out of nowhere. So the deck feels like it's attacking on so many fronts and Cami of Transients really enables those huge combo turns where you can just one shot the opponent out of nowhere. Then the ability that it's recursive as well is really big. You know, um, we have a lot of enchantment creatures in the deck. We've got Cami of Bamboo Grove, Sanctum Weaver and Sithis Harvest Hand. And these are all must kill threats. So, you know, Cami of Transients is also a must kill threat itself. If the opponent kills the Cami of Transients and then we play a uh, Sithis or Sanctum Weaver, they're very incentivized to kill these and since they're enchantments we will then get cameo transients back when they die similarly we also have showdown of the skull which is a saga so when this reaches the third chapter it will sacrifice itself and go to the graveyard which again will trigger cameo transients to come back so this is really important because it enables the crazy explosive turns with hardened scales where we can just one shot the opponent is kind of a must kill threat and then once it is killed we can just get it back over and over again so cameo transients is a really important part of the deck then we've also got four copies of Satessant champions so this is kind of the perfect card because it's an enchantress card itself 
and it also has good synergies with the plus one plus one counters. So this is a three mana one three, and whenever enchantment enters the battlefield under our control, we put a plus one plus one counter on it and draw a card. So typically in enchantress decks, at the three mana slot, you usually run enchantress's presence. I'm not a huge fan of enchantress's presence in this deck specifically because this is much more of an aggressive deck than the nine life solemnity enchantress deck, which is the other main enchantress deck in historic. That deck is much more of a control deck with like a prison element, whereas this deck is much more about committing to the board, applying pressure being able to stabilize against the aggressive decks and then attacking through to win the game so the fact that this is a creature is really nice at enabling that and then the fact that it also puts a plus one plus one counter on it when we get an enchantment in play means that not only does it play well with our enchantress synergy because it's going to generate a, a ton of card advantage but it also plays really well with hardened scales now typically on an enchantress effect like this it's better to have it on the cast trigger like we've got with Sithis because if the enchantment gets countered we still get the draw if they kill our enchantress in response to cards Casting it, we still get the draw. So typically, it's usually a downside to have the enchantment have to enter play. But in this deck specifically, it's actually not because of hardened scales. So the way it works with hardened scales is, if you have Stessant Champion in play and you cast the hardened scales, you won't get the Constellation trigger until hardened scales enters the battlefield, which means that you immediately get the effect of hardened scales. You immediately put two plus one plus one counters on the Stessant Champion. So this can grow insanely quickly. Um, and the other great thing about Stessant Champion is even before it grows, the fact that it's a 3 mana card means that if we play this on turn 3, the opponent has to trigger Revolt in order to kill it with Fatal Push. The fact that it's a 1-3 means that it's not killed by Unholy Heat either, so this does actually trade, or it, it's very difficult for the opponent to kill it with the most commonly played removal spells in the format because it dodges Unholy Heat and requires them to immediately have a way to trigger Revolt if they're going to kill it with Fatal Push. So it is surprisingly difficult to kill when you play it on turn 3, and then it will just run away with the game, especially if we have hardened scales, it starts growing insanely quickly as well. So Test and Champion, perfect card for both our Enchantress game plan and the hardened scales game plan. Then we've also got four copies of Showdown of the Scald, so this is one of the most important cards in the deck. So. 4 mana saga and first chapter we excel the top 4 cards of our library until the end of the next turn we can play those cards so the fact that we have such a low curve in the deck is really nice because even if we play this on turn 4 we can often cast all of the cards that we hit off it which is really nice and I really like the fact that we're getting a ton of card advantage straight away you know as I was saying earlier Enchantress's presence is one of the main in, uh, sort of card advantage engines that you want to be running in an enchantment decks but this deck is much more about speed much more about trying to go off and be as explosive as possible as early as possible and Enchantress's Presence is quite a slow card in that regard unless you have Sanctum Weaver on the battlefield you don't start casting that many you know drawing that many cards or casting that many spells in a turn especially if you just cast it on turn three whereas Showdown of the Skulls immediately gets us four cards straight away so you're getting a ton of a card advantage immediately and like I said, because the curve of the deck is so low, we can often cast all of them in the same turn. So this allows us to give us a really good way to grind in the late game. But the second and third chapter on this is also really, really important. So like I said, second and third chapter, whenever we cast a spell this turn, we put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature we control. So this is a way to completely go off with hardened scales. Like I said, we have some crazy explosive combo-ish turns in this deck. And the second and third chapter of Showdown of the Scalds is one of the main ways that we can do that. You know, especially if we have Cameo of Transients in play, when this hits the second or third chapter, if we have hardened scales or multiple copies of hardened scales, you know, say we hit a couple of hardened scales off the Showdown of the Scalds, we can grow our creatures so, so fast, build up an overwhelming board in one turn, and just one shot the opponent out of nowhere. So Showdown of the Scalds, really great as giving us a really good way to refuel. And then the second and third chapter also enables these crazy combo-ish turns where we can just build up an insurmountable board and just attack in full lethal in one go. So that's sort of the main plus one plus one counter synergy in the deck. Now we'll have a look at some of the Enchantress effects. So obviously we've gone over to Tessant Champion works as an enchantress effect that also grows itself very well with hardened scales but we've also got four copies of Sithis Harvest Hand so this is an enchantress effect on two mana which is so strong that's way above rate for what you would expect but not only that but it also, it also gains us a life whenever we cast an enchantment as well so this card is really strong because it similar to Stessant Champion and Showdown of the Scalds gives us access to this really strong late game where if the opponent can't kill it we're just going to run away with card advantage and just be able to generate so much advantage that the opponent isn't going to be able to get back into the game. The fact that we gain a life off this every time is also really, really huge because <clears throat> there are so many decks in the format that punish you for stabilizing at a low life total, like the Cat Oven decks, like Is It Phoenix, for example. So the fact that we can just buffer our life total as we're gaining a bunch of card advantage really helps to put those sorts of games out of reach for the opponent, which is really, really huge. So the really great thing about this deck 
in addition to having aggressive starts and comboish turns, is that Sithis, Tessent Champion, and Showdown of the Skelds all gov give us this really, really strong late game. So against a lot of decks, we can just afford to sit back if we're in the controlling role, you know, build up a really big board of blockers so the opponent can't attack in. And then if we can land a Sithis, a Tessent Champion, or Showdown, we're just going to run away with the game in the late game. So not only do we have very fast aggressive starts and crazy comboish turns, but we also have a really, really strong late game where if the opponent can't kill S Sithis or Tessent Champion, we just run away with card advantage and it's very, imp very difficult for the opponent to get back into the game. Then we've also got four copies of Sanctum Weaver and this is potentially the most important card in the deck because since we have so many ways to refill with Sithis, Tessent Champion and Showdown of the Skelds, the main choke point in the deck is mana. You know, you're going to be generating a ton of card advantage but you're often not going to have all the mana to be able to cast it immediately. But Sanctum Weaver is the way that unlocks all that mana to allow you to have some crazy explosive starts. So two mana, mana dork, but it adds X mana, where X is the number of enchantments we control. So you can have some absolutely insane starts with this. If you cast this on turn two, by the time you get to turn four, this is going to be tapping for something like six or seven mana, which is absolutely insane for a two mana creature. And you, as you'll see in the gameplay, if you get to keep Sanctum Weaver on the battlefield, you are just going to run away with the game if you have any of your ways to refuel. And <clears throat> like I said, the only real thing stopping you going absolutely crazy with this deck is the amount of mana, and Sanctum Weaver just completely unlocks that for you. So Sanctum Weaver, one of the most important cards in the deck, and enables some crazy explosive turns. And we've also got Cami of Bamboo Groves for a similar thing, you know. Obviously it's nowhere near as good as Sanctum Weaver, there's basically no replacement for Weaver, and I, I would obviously be running 8 copies if I could, but Cami of Bamboo Groves does help in that way as well, in that it helps us get ahead on mana so that we can start making more use of the cards that we draw. So this is a 1 mana 1-1, one, one, and when it enters the battle field we can put a land from our hand into the battlefield tapped so you know like I said it's kind of like a worse version of Sanctum Weaver just to help us get ahead on mana so that we can take advantage of our ways that we have of refueling. Additionally the fact that it's enchantment is great because it plays with all of our enchantment synergies. The fact that it's also one mana is really huge because as, as you can see we're already pretty skewed towards the two drop slot. We do have a number of two mana enchantments in the sideboard as well so if we didn't have Cami of, Cami of Bamboo Groves at the one mana slot our mana curve would start to be pretty heavily skewed towards two which would be a bit annoying so the fact that we can get ahead on mana on turn one is really huge with this deck. Um, and then additionally the channel ability while something that you're not usually happy to do the fact you have the option for it is really important because there will be certain draws um, for example oh yeah one thing to to be mindful of with Cami of Bamboo Groves is that with your pathways you don't get to pick which side to put them on so there will be certain starts for example where you have like stomping ground and a branched off pathway and you need to be playing the pathway on white in that instance you can't really afford to play Cami on turn one because you would lock yourself out of white matter in those situations so the fact that we have the ability to channel it later in the game if we miss land drop so you know say we get to turn four and we don't hit our fourth land drop while we're not thrilled to do it, the fact that we can just channel this away to get two lands into our hand and then we're guaranteed to have our fifth land as well is nice upside and I have done that multiple times and it's ended up saving me the game so Kami is really good on turn one then once we have our enchantress effects later in the game we can either channel it to get two more lands or just play it as a way to draw cards off Sithis and Satessant Champions so Kami really important to get head on mana but also synergizes really nicely with all, our, all of our other enchantment synergies as well and then finally the last card in the deck is four copies of Baffling End so this is just the best enchantment interaction that you can be running and while our proactive game plan is very good and we can build up a big board as well which does usually help against the aggressive decks I did feel like I wanted some interaction in the deck and Baffling End is just the best option because it exiles, which means that it plays around stuff like Selfless Savior. You know, if there's any creatures that have graveyard synergies, this just gets rid of them permanently. The fact that they don't get the creature back when Baffling End dies is really nice as well. And it's obviously an enchantment itself, so it plays really nicely with all of our other enchantment synergies as well. And then additionally, we've also got Gigantha as the companion. Now, <clears throat> this is kind of just a free card, basically, because we can run it. But Gigantha is actually really important in this deck, especially against decks with a lot of interaction, because... If we end up keeping a hand off the back of Sithis or Satessant Champion and the opponent kills it, if we get unlucky with draws and we just end up, end up flooding out, the fact that we can just put Gigantha into our hand and play it is really nice because the decks that are typically going to be packing a lot of interaction like Rakdos Midrange will struggle to deal with a big creature so it's a great way to stabilise, give us some time to draw more into cards like Showdown of the Scalds or additional Satessant Champions and Sithis to run away with the game. Uh, and then additionally, the fact that it produces mana can be really important as well, because like I said, mana is one of the choke points in this deck, so say for example we have a Gigantha in play and we've completely used up all of our, or we've used up a lot of our mana, 
and we have like a showdown of the scouts and a green card, we can just tap this to produce extra three mana that we can use that turn. So Jacanthor is really nice as just a free card. It's great at stabilizing it if we end up flooding out, but it's also nice as a way for us to produce extra mana if we need to combo off a little bit further. And then in terms of the mana base, we've got 24 lands here, which has felt like a decent amount because we need to be hitting our third land drop on time for Tessent Champion and Showdown of the Scouts, but you don't want to be running too many lands because we do have a lot of ways to draw, and if we're running more than 24, I feel like we're just going to be flooding out way too often because we're going to be drawing a, d a bunch of cards off Tessent Champion and Sithis, and it always feels really bad to play Showdown and hit like three or four lands, so 24 is felt like a decent amount. Uh, in terms of the actual lands themselves, thankfully since red is basically just a splash in the stack for showdown and a few sideboard cards, there's not really that much pressure on the dual lands, which means that we can afford to run a single basic and a beside you as well, which is really nice at just additional interaction against other enchantments and artifacts, which is great, and obviously gets its cost reduced by Gigantha and Sithis as well, which is really nice. But yeah, anyway, that's the main deck. It's felt so good. Like I've said, the deck can attack on so many different angles. It has access to very fast aggressive starts. It has ways to build up our board so we can block against aggro decks. It has some crazy combo-ish turns because of Showdown and, and Sanctum Weaver. And because of our ways to refuel like Showdown, Stessant Champion and Sithis, we also have a really strong late game as well. So the deck attacks on a lot of fronts and it's been a ton of fun to play as well. Uh, now anyway, onto the sideboard. Starting off, we've got four copies of Rest in Peace. So this is the Graveyard Hate of Choice that I've gone for. Obviously it's an enchantment so it plays really well with our enchant enchantment synergies. Now typically in most decks you're not really happy to be playing more, more than maybe two or three copies of Rest in Peace because it is a card where the second and third copies if you draw them don't really do anything but because we're an enchantment deck we don't really care about that because we have ways to make use of that, you know. If we do draw our second or third copies with a Sithis or Stessant Champion in play, it just replaces itself immediately. It also helps trigger Generous Visitor and Cameo of Transients, so running four copies in this deck is actually not a drawback at all because we make a lot of use of just casting enchantments anyway. Uh, the reason I've gone for four copies specifically is because this is a card that really, really turns the Is It Phoenix matchup on its head. Every single time that I draw this against Phoenix and can resolve it, the matchup feels so much better, so I really want to maximise my chance of drawing it in that matchup and it just feels like the most important card there so I wanted to be running four copies. Um, it's also very good against the uh, food decks specifically because we can shut off Cat Oven and Lurus as well and it also stops the Meat Hook Massacre dealing us damage as well so it's very effective in that matchup and also you know even though most of the red-black mid-range decks I've come across recently have been moving away from Arcanist, there are still red-black Arcanist decks running Arcanist and Croxer as well. In addition to that, there, I've seen an, an uptick in Greasefang on the ladder since I covered it for my last deck profile. So rest in peace, very effective against a lot of the metagame right now, but specifically, this is the best card in the Is It Phoenix matchup, so you want to you want to maximise your chances of drawing it. Then for additional removal, we've got two copies of Arnie Slays the Troll and three copies of Seal Away. So first of all, Arnie Slays the Troll. I really like this card. I think it's really powerful. So this is a saga. On the first chapter, target creature fights up to one target creature you don't control. On the second chapter, you add a red mana and put two plus one plus one counters on a creature we control. And on the third chapter, you gain life equal to the greatest power among creatures you control. So the reason this is in the deck is to be able to deal with bigger creatures. Obviously, the downside of running Baffling End is that it can only kill creatures with mana value three or less. So Arnie Slays the Troll allows us to kill bigger problematic creatures which is really nice because we have a ton of ways to grow creatures you know like I said Generous Visitor and Cameo Transients are going to be growing very very quickly so Arnie Slays the Troll we're often going to have a big creature that we can use to fight then the second chapter we add a red mana and put two plus one plus one counters on creatures we control so the plus one plus one counters synergize great with hardened scales obviously it's another way to just put counters on our creatures and the fact that it adds red mana um, also ramps us so in, in like an ideal world, I've had this happen a few times where we can go turn one Generous, generous Visitor, turn two Arnie Slays the Troll, Generous Visitor will get a counter so we can kill something like a Dragon's Rage Channel immediately, and then on turn three we get to put two counters on our creature and generate a red mana which then allows us to ramp into Showdown of the Scouts on turn three. So Arnie Slays the Troll really enables some crazy starts if we do get lucky. And then the fact that we also gain some life on the third chapter is really nice as well because Outside of Sithis, we don't have any ways to gain life, so against decks where the opponent is going to be running bigger creatures, being able to gain life is just nice upside on that as well. And then we've also got three copies of Seal Away, so in addition to Baffling End, the only other real card that I was tempted to be running in this slot, you want to be making sure that your, um, your removal is enchantment based because, you know, the enchantment synergies are really important in the deck. The fact that Generous Visitor and Cameo of Transients on, and also Stessant Champion aren't enchantments themselves means that you want every single other card in the deck to be an enchantment really so you want your extra removal to be enchantment based the only other one that I was considering running was Candle Trap now this is a card that I initially tested in the main deck 
And the really nice thing about Candle Trap is it's one mana, which means that it cycles way easier with our Enchantress effects. It also means that we're going to be generating more mana off Sanctum Weaver quicker. But the big downside of Candle Trap is that it's very bad if the opponent has a creature with an ability, which most creatures in the format do. And I think this is an even worse sideboard card because typically matchups where you're bringing in removal, you want to deal with the creature for good, and Candle Trap is pretty inefficient at that. So I really like Seal Away as the other option to be running. And the nice thing about Seal Away is it helps to kind of fix that problem with Baffling End in that it can hit bigger creatures. Oh, the, o the other option actually I was thinking of was Circle of Confinement. So this is basically just a slightly worse Baffling End. So again, it, it exiles a creature with mana value 3 or less. The downside of it is that if the opponent kills the Circle of Confinement, they get the creature back, whereas Baffling End gives them a 3-3. Three, three. So that was a consideration, but I prefer Steal Away because even though the opponent does need to be attacking for us to, or, or have attacked for us to be able to use it, and it doesn't kill creatures with Vigilance, I like that it can kill bigger creatures, you know, like I said, one of the weak points of the removal in the deck is that it can't kill creatures with mana value 4 or higher, so the fact that Seal Away can kill stuff like Arclight Phoenix and Crackling Drake is really huge, and I just like it as sort of a surprise element as well, a lot of people don't expect you to be running it, so we'll just attack into it as well, so Seal Away has felt nice as just additional removal against opposing creature decks, and, you know, specifically against a deck like Is It Phoenix as well, it's very effective at killing their bigger creatures, like Storming Entity, like <coughs> Arc Light Phoenix itself. So I've, I've really liked Steal Away as the additional removal. Then we've also got three copies of Sa uh, Shape of Sanctuary, so this is very, very good against decks that are running single target removal. So this is mainly for against control decks, and also other sort of control-ish mid-range decks, like the Red-Black mid-range deck as well. So the really nice thing about Shape of Sanctuary in this build particular is that we have so many must-kill threats. Generous Visitor and Cameo of Transients kind of are must-kill threats because they'll just grow too big if the opponent doesn't kill them. Sanctum Weaver, Sithis and Satessant Champion also run away with the game if the opponent can't kill them. So against decks like Ragback Midrange or Control where if they don't kill these creatures we're just going to run away with the game. They, have, they don't really have an option but to kill it. And Shape of Sanctuary is just really good protection against that. It's an enchantment so it plays with all of our enchantment synergies. It's one mana so it's very efficiently costed for what it does. So Shape of Sanctuary, very important against the more controlling decks. And then finally we've got two copies of Cindervine, so this is mainly here as a way to kill enchantments and artifacts. There's also an enchantment itself, so again, I wanted to make sure that all of the cards that we're boarding in are enchantments themselves, because like I said, we've got 12 cards in the deck that aren't enchantments, so you want to make sure that everything else in the deck is an enchantment, or you can end up in situations where you have one of your enchantress effects, but you don't have any ways to trigger it. And Cindervines is just very important against decks that run must kill artifacts and enchantments like against the food deck it can kill witches oven and trade of crumbs against affinity it's very good at killing all of their artifacts and also it can be useful against control as well because they typically run stuff like portable hole search for Ascanta, and against control as well we're going to be dealing chip damage with this across the course of the game which is also important because we are essentially an aggro deck in that matchup as well so cindervine's very nice against any deck running artifacts and enchantments that we need to be able to kill and also good against control to be able to deal chip damage and take out their artifacts and enchantments as well so anyway, that's the deck. Like I said, it's been so much fun and the deck attacks on so many different angles as well. So definitely check it out if you think you'll like it. Uh, next up we've got some gameplay. I've got five matches that I was playing with this deck on the ladder so you guys can see the deck in action. If you've got any questions at all, drop me a comment below and I hope you enjoy the gameplay. Big up. Okay, sweet. Here we go. Okay, so we're going first here, which is great. And yeah, this looks decent. We've got turn one Cami of Bamboo Groves. We've got uh, Sanctum Weaver and Sithis, which is a great combination. And potentially Statesant Champion on turn two as well, if we wanted, because of the Cami of Bamboo Groves. So definitely going to lead on the Cami here and put Poseidon into play. Thankfully, we had another pathway. You know, one of the downsides of Cami is that you're forced to play the pathway on its front side when you're using the Cami effect. Thankfully, we have another white source here already, though. Okay, Radiant Fountain. So I imagine we're against... Um, Colourless Ramp. Now I was thinking about playing Satessant Champion on 2, but now we've drawn Showdown of the Scowls, I'm definitely going to lead on Sanctum Weaver here because thankfully Sanctum Weaver can tap for mana of any colour, so it can fix us red mana to enable us to play Showdown here, which is really nice. Plus it's going to be tapping for 2 mana immediately. Okay, drawing another white source is huge here because now we can play Sithis and Showdown in the same turn, which is pretty sick. So we want to get Showdown into play here because this matchup is all about racing. We need to kill them before they get a chance to play Ugin, basically, is what this matchup is going to come down to. And getting Showdown into play as soon as possible is crucial because of the second and third chapters buffing our board to allow us to attack for a bunch of damage, which is, like I said, this matchup is all about racing, so that's the most important thing. If we hadn't drawn a second white or red source there, I think we would have just had to play Showdown 
and not play Sithis. Because like I said, we're all about racing. We just need to present as fast a clock as we can. And Showdown really helps us to do that. Not only because it digs for four cards deep, but also because it starts putting a bunch of counters on stuff. So, Okay, Power Stone starts. So the opponent's obviously ramping here. So, I think we want to get Setessant Champion into play first, and then I'm happy to play the second showdown of the Scouts here, I think. Setessant Champion into play is good because it, you know, helps to increase our clock even further. It will start growing as we play more enchantments. I'm going to put the plus one plus one counters on the Kami of Bamboo Graves because that's the creature I care least about dying. You know, obviously we want to keep Sanctum Weaver and Sithis in play to get bonuses off them. I'm going to make sure we tap... Uh, the Weaver for green mana because that's the most prominent colour in the deck. There's a very good chance we hit green cards off showdown. Okay, Hardened Scales is sick because that will start putting so much, so many counts on the board. I think we've got a pretty good chance of winning now. Wow, okay, so we hit Weavers as well. So I think we're more interested in putting Weaver into play here than Hardened Scales because Sanctum Weaver is a card that is so powerful if you're on tap with it, so you generally want to get it into play as quickly as possible. And then next turn we can really pop off with, you know, we'll have Hardened Scales, we'll have Generous Visitor. Wow, we just drew another Generous Visitor, so yeah. If the opponent can't sweep the board here, I think we're almost certain to be winning next turn off the back of Hardened Scales. and Because we'll, we'll have both Showdown of the Scalds going at the same time, so for every card we cast, we'll be getting plus one plus one counters on creatures from both Showdowns. Then that will obviously get multiplied by the Hardened Scales when we play that as well. And we've got Generous Visitors, so once we've got Hardened Scales into play, those will each be putting two counts on stuff as well. Okay, so Forsaken Monument, so we're, we're pretty much guaranteed to win here. You know, this was mainly off the back of the Sanctum Weavers though. Weaver producing so much mana has really helped us to get ahead here. So definitely going to lead on Temple Garden, and we want to get Hardened Scales into play first here, just so we start multiplying all the counters really quickly. And we're going to be way over 20 damage here, I'm pretty sure. We're going to put all the counters on the Kami, see how big we can make it. But yeah, I'm pretty certain we're just going to be able to easily win here. So Kami's already up to a 6-6. Six, six. Then we can play both the Generous Visitors, and then every enchantment we play after that will trigger Generous Visitor on, on each one, which will then put, what is that, like four counters on everything, plus the Showdown triggers as well. It's going to get out of control pretty quickly here. Okay, so opponent activates the Maze Mind Tome, I assumed, so they just don't have to keep passing priority. Okay, they top, so I mean, Kami's already a 10-10. I'm pretty sure we just very easily win here. Now it goes up to a 14-14. And then, you know, we play an enchantment and we get four triggers from the Showdown and the Generous Visitors, all of which put two counters on, on the Kami here, so yeah, very easily win here. And you know, Showdown plus Sanctum Weaver, when you hit Hardened Scales, is just crazy. You just kind of pop off. Yeah, okay, sweet. So sideboarding here, we definitely want Sin Divines to be able to deal with their artifacts and also deal some chip damage. Baffling End is basically does nothing here. Now, it's between Shape of Sanctuary and Arnie Slays the Troll here. I think Shape of Sanctuary is better just in case they board into single target removal. Arnie Slays the Troll is a consideration to be able to kill bigger creatures like... Golos, or Gol Golos, however you say that, if they bring that in, but I think Shape of Sanctuary is better because they're probably more likely to have single target removal than playing a Golos, and also Arnie Slays the Troll when they don't have creatures is just going to sit in our hand, whereas Shape of Sanctuary is just a one mana enchantment that we can get down quickly. So this hand looks pretty sick, we've got <clears throat> Turn 1 Kami again, we've got Weaver, Visitor, and Setessant Champion, so... Yeah, it's looking good. If we didn't have Setessant Champion, this hand would be a little bit more sketchy because whilst Weaver, as you could see last game, is just such an unreal card at allowing explosive starts, you can have hands where you kind of run out of gas if you don't have it alongside a Showdown, Setessant Champion, or Sithis. So, okay, opponent has the Mind Stone here. So, again, I was tempted to just play Setessant Champion, but now we've drawn the Showdown, I think we're more incentivized to get Weaver into play. Uh, obviously we should play the Generous Visitor first if we're going to do that so that we get a plus one plus one counter on the Kami when we cast the Sanctum Weaver. But yeah, now we've got Showdown, I'm pretty sure that Weaver's good again. You know, as you saw last game, Showdown plus Weaver is just unreal. So if we can get Showdown to play quickly, we should hopefully be able to race, even though we're going second here. Okay, if no Dreadlands and the Chef Net Jeans, that makes me think they probably have removal here. Either Black Sweepers, or they could have like Wrath of Gods as well, I guess. Okay, so they do have Portable Hole. 
So, that, oh wow, okay, they take the Generous Visitor. I mean, I guess from their side that makes sense because they don't know that we have an Enchantress effect. Like I was saying, if we have Weaver but no way to generate card advantage, it's not actually that great. Whereas Generous Visitor produces a bunch of plus one plus one counters. So, from their side, it kind of makes sense for them to do that. But obviously, now we have tons of ways to refuel. Weaver was definitely the more pressing threat. So we could go showdown here, but I actually think I prefer getting Satessant Champion and Harden Scales into play here. I don't think we can... Just trying to think if there's a way we could play Satessant Champion and showdown in the same turn. I don't think there is, but I'm going to tap Weaver for the green mana first. I want to get Satessant Champion into play because it will just increase our clock. You know, we'll get Harden Scales into play here. Satessant Champion will become a 3-5. Okay, nice. The reason I tapped the Weaver for mana first there was because I wanted to have access to white and uh, red mana for what we drew off the Satessant Champion. But yeah, now we've got Satessant Champion into play, we can go for Showdown next turn, and now we'll be getting a ton of counters on Satessant Champion, and we'll get counters from Degenerous Visitor, which get multiplied by Hardened Scale. So I think getting Champion into play first helps to increase the speed of our clock quite substantially there. So this is a little bit scary because they could have Forsaken Monument here, which means they can set up for Ugin next turn, and I'm not... Yeah, okay, so they do have the Forsaken Monument. I'm not 100% sure we'll be able to kill with what we hit off Showdown this turn, so we'll just have to hope we get lucky. You know, there is definitely some hits we get. If we get multiple Harden Scales off this Showdown, we can definitely win this turn, but we'll just have to see what we get here. Okay, interesting. So, I think I quite like playing the second Showdown here, because if they do play Ugin, it gives us more stuff to recover with the following turn, and if they don't, it sets up for pretty much a guaranteed win next turn. They need pretty much exactly Ugin to win here. I'm not even sure Ulamog does it, really, because, you know, they'd have to take out Sanctum Weaver to shut off our mana, and then we still have, you know, Showdown plus Scales. We've got another Scales in the Exile now, so I think they need exactly Ugin to survive here. I don't think anything else does it, really. Or if they were running like Platinum Angel or something like that. We don't have an out to that, but I very much doubt they're main decking something like that. So, just have to keep fingers crossed they don't play Ugin here. I mean, it's a pretty good sign that they're in the tank, because if they had Ugin, I'm pretty sure they would just slam it immediately in mi uh, minus four. So, the fact they're taking their time makes me think they probably don't. And honestly, I can't think of anything in their deck that can save them here. You know, they've got, they've got Ulamog, like I said, but... I don't think that would be enough, because they're at three. I guess they gain a bunch of life off the Forsaken Monument, so maybe it would get them there. So Khan, I can't think of any Khan Wishboard targets. They've got, what, six mana here? I don't think they've got anything that could save them. They could grab a creature, but we can very easily just pump all of our boards to have enough uh, power to attack around it. They could get Sky Sovereign to kill the Weaver, but we already have Lethal on board, so... Oh well, Metalwork Colossus, okay. So they did get a creature, but again, I don't think that's going to be good enough. Even if they cast the Colossus here, they need to have something else. Okay, interesting. So they have Mystic Forge. So I assume they can still cast the Colossus here, yeah. So Colossus is free. They go up to 9, but they need to chain together a bunch of stuff off the top of the library with Forge to be able to stay alive here. Because it's very easy f for this from this point for us to give like two or three of our creatures 9 power and attack around this Colossus. So, we'll definitely lead on the hardened scales here. We want to start multiplying our counters that we get off Showdown and Generous Visitor straight away. So, we'll already be getting two counters off each of the triggers here from the single hardened scales we've got in play. Um, the goal here is to just buff uh, Kami, Sessant Champion, and the Visitor to above 9 power so that we can just attack around this Colossus here. So, Sessant Champion is going to trigger here, and... Since both Hardened Scales are in play, we'll immediately get two extra counters on them. Then we can play the Shaper Sanctuary. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very... No, we, we, we had way too much power there. Okay, so we're going first here. And ha, I can't keep a one lander, unfortunately. This, on the other hand, looks pretty decent, though. I'm trying to think what we want to put back here. Probably Satessant Champion because we have um, we have Sithis and Sanctum Weaver already, so we don't necessarily need the third one. And I do want to keep battling in, in case we're against aggressive deck. There is definitely an argument to holding on to Hardened Scales to trigger the Sithis, but I quite like getting Scales down on one here because if we play Weaver on two, it allows us to play both Sithis and Battling End 
on turn three, even if we miss our third land drop, which is quite important because we'll already have an extra enchantment in play, which gives us an extra mana off the Sanctum Weaver. Okay, so it looks like we're against Morning Red Aggro here. And think that drawing an extra Baffling End is great. Oh, we're against Goblins. Okay, interesting. Okay, we did hit our third land drop, but I still think it was better to play Scales on one here because now we can go Sithis and Baffling End. I'm going to play the Baffling End before our land for the turn in case we drew uh, an Inspiring Vantage. Because if we drew an Inspiring Vantage and we played our pathway first, then we wouldn't be able to play it. Well, it would be tapped next turn. Interesting. So we're against Goblins with Ringleader. So. <clears throat> I guess that helps if they've got Krenko in hand. Giving Krenko haste is pretty sick, and giving Maxis haste is pretty nice as well. Okay, so they've got Prospector, which is scary. We, we kind of have to kill the Prospector here, because otherwise they'll have six mana for Maxis next turn. Ha, huh, Showdown. So, hmm. While I would love to play Showdown here, I think it's a bit risky, because if we miss a white or green... Uh, sorry, if we if we don't hit a white or red land off the top of the Showdown trigger, then we can't kill the Prospector. And I think killing Prospector is super important here, because it ta you know they could have Muxus next turn. If they don't, then we've got, they've got to wait three turns to, to play it. So even though we didn't get to play Showdown, we can still play Stessant Champion and put Gigantha into our hand here, which is really nice. You know, This is one of the big upsides of having Gigantha here. Because Weaver produces so much excess mana that we can often just put it into our hand for free. And that we can also... Oh, okay, so they did have Cranker with Haste. That's pretty nice. Um, so that is a bit of a concern because... We basically need to force them to start chump blocking here. So we'll tap the Weaver for white mana. So we can play Showdown here. And I think our goal here is to try and force them to block. Because the thing is with Cranko is... You want to... Well, from the opponent's perspective, they want to not block with as much as possible because they will exponentially grow their tokens each turn so our goal here is to try and force them to block as many of our creatures as possible so that their Krenko tokens multiply slower so we're going to play the generous visitor first just to try and pump up our boards and again we're just trying to incentivize them to block here as much as possible so i think we're just gonna try and grow our generous visitor and stessant champion and probably sith this a bit as well but the whole goal here, like I've said, is just try and make them chump block, and then that will slow their tokens growing down. Uh, I like getting an extra Sanctum Weaver in play because it allows us to um, it allows us to sort of pop off even further next turn. Um, oh wow, okay, Cameo Transients is sick here as well because even if they do produce a bunch of tokens, you know, Baffling End that we're doing there isn't that great to kill a one-one. But like I said. We really want them to be blocking here so their Krenko tokens don't multiply as fast. Um, so Cambi of Transients is pretty sick because even if they do uh, produce a bunch of tokens, we can just pump up our Cami and, and attack through for Trample. And with Showdown triggering to the second chapter and a Harden Scales into play, we should be able to pop off pretty hard next turn. So, so we'll see what they do here. Okay, thankfully they only have... Well, we'll see if they have another one. Okay, they only have one goblin, so that's only three tokens in play. If they'd taken more damage and they had more goblins, it would have been a lot more difficult, but thankfully we drew Kami, so even if we don't have lethal this turn, we should be able to force it through next turn. So we'll play the Kami, start putting more counters on stuff. So I think we're pretty interested in pumping up some of our board here and also the Kami so that we're guaranteed to win next turn. Um, hmm, I'm just trying to think if that was a mistake, uh, because there's a chance we can pump up the rest of our board anyway, and win this turn, potentially, hold on, I think I still want to pump Kami for now, because, ha, huh, actually thinking about it, we probably have enough counters here off the hardened scales to buff our whole board above 13 power, because if we can get four creatures to above 13 power, even though they have three goblins in play, we can just win next turn anyway. Which I think is pretty important because, you know, we could just pump all of our counters onto the Kami, but with Herald's Horn in play, they could very easily just cast Noxus next turn. So, I mean, thankfully we... It looks like we have enough triggers here to pump our whole board above 13 power. 
Yeah, okay. So thankfully we do have enough power here to be able to do that. But we shouldn't have pumped any of our counters onto the Kami. We should have just realised a little bit earlier that we have enough to... Or we, I mean, I guess it depended on what we drew off the Satessant Champion and Sithis. Okay, yeah, it didn't end up mattering, but we shouldn't have put any counters on the Kami there. I think we should have just realised that we had enough to pump our whole board and win there. So sideboard-wise, you know, Krenko unfortunately doesn't get hit by Baffling in, so I think we need to bring in Arnie Slays the Troll here. We could bring in Sealerway as another way to deal with Krenko, but I'm not sure we have that many cards that we really want to be cutting in this matchup, so... And I think I prefer Arnie Slays the Troll to Seal Away because we can kill Krenko before it activates, whereas Seal Away we have to wait for them to activate it. And then I think we can trim a Kami in a Showdown. You know, Kami is a card that, like I said, is very important at getting us ahead on mana like Sanctum Weaver, but we don't necessarily always need four post sideboard. And I think Showdown of the Scalds, you know, it's a very important tool to grind late in the game, but I think this is a matchup where the first few turns are much more important than the late game. We already probably have a better late game outside of them having Muxus, so I think trimming a showdown here is also reasonable. So we can lead on Generous Visitor on turn one here, and then we've got Sanctum Weaver on to turn two, into Sithis and, and Baffling End on three, which is great. Okay, Snoop is a bit annoying to see. Like, we would obviously love to play Baffling End to stop them getting value off it, but I think we just have to play Weaver here because Getting Weaver into play on turn 2 just unlocks so much mana going into turn 3 and 4. Ha, so they do get a Prospector off the top for free, which is a bit annoying. Like I said, buffling ending the Snoop before it gets value is pretty appealing, but Weaver just unlocks so much mana that I think it's almost always worth playing Weaver on turn 2 if you have a good follow-up. So they get the Prospector off the top. They also have Herald's Horn in play. Ha okay, so they're using the Prospector ability. That's pretty nice because now they reduce all the cost of their goblins and they're guaranteed to hit with Herald's Horn next turn because they have pros they know they have Prospector on top. Now, unfortunately, that does make the Baffling Ends in our hand pretty dead now. So I think rather than playing Sithis, we're going to make more use of our mana and just play the Satessant Champion here. And then we can start triggering Satessant Champion by playing Sithis the following turn now. Now, the good thing for us is the opponent did miss on lands there. Okay, they drew one for the turn, but they are slightly behind on mana, which is pretty important because it cuts, especially with Herald's Horn in play, it slows down their Muxus. Okay, so they've got a two mana War Chief, that's pretty sick. So we absolutely have to kill the War Chief here. They could still potentially cast Muxus. Um, so there is an argument to potentially double Baffling Ending here, but I think it's more important that we just start committing to the board and applying pressure rather than just playing on the back foot. So we'll lead on Sithis here. Then I'll play the Kami of Transients, and I think getting Kami of Transients in play this turn is really important because it allows us to start popping off next turn to force the hopefully force lethal damage through. Especially if we do something like a Hardened Scales. So we'll Baffling End away the War Chief here. Again, there's definitely an argument to playing both Baffling Ends to take them off the Prospector because they could play Muxus next turn, but I like just developing a bit more here. You know, they would need a pretty good Muxus hit, even if they did have Muxus to be able to win here, so... So we'll pass it back. And they would need to hit another land drop as well. We know they've missed lands, so they would need to also hit another land drop and have exactly Muxus to... for us to really get punished for not playing the battle again. And, you know, they do have another War Chief now, so thankfully they didn't have Muxus. Or they might have Muxus, but they didn't have their fourth land, so... Having this battling end to kill the War Chief is also pretty important, I think. And, you know, had we played the Baffling End, there's, we might not have been able to play the Kami. Okay, sick. We hit Hardened Scales, which is pretty good. So now we're just going to pump all of our counters into the Kami of Transients. Um, and that's going to make combat really difficult for the opponent, because our other creatures are going to grow as well. We're obviously going to use this Baffling End to take out the War Chief. So unless they have a removal spell here, we're pretty much guaranteed to win. So we'll put more counters on the Kami here. It will grow from its own ability as well. It's getting two counters every single time. So it's already up to a 9-9. We do Showdown, which we can play off the Sanctum Weaver as well. So we can also kill the War Chief with the Baffling Ends. Okay, yeah, 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 we got there. Nice. Okay, so I've faced this opponent a couple times already, and they've been on auras each time. I actually lost to them last time I played them, so this is definitely a tough matchup. Okay, so they're on Lurus, so I'm pretty sure they're on auras. And this hand... If I didn't know what they were on, maybe it's a keep, but I know they're on auras, so... Ha, huh, this isn't great either, but we have Showdown to dig for removal. 
and I don't really want to go down to a five card hand. I mean, maybe that was, maybe there's an argument to mulling again and trying to hit a baffling end, but we have, you know, if we can draw a sanctum weaver or something, we're really good here, and we have showdown to dig for removal. So I think we just have to hope the opponent has a slow hand here. Well, they offered the trade with the sentinel. I'm definitely going to take this because, even though the generous visitor is going to grow, we need to. Like, we're kind of relying on playing non-creature spells here, like Showdown or like Baffling End. So, last time I played the opponent, I it went to game two and three, and I used Seal Away against them. So I'm going to set stops during my own turn and during the opponent's turn here to bluff Seal Away. Because if I hadn't set stops during my turn, it would have just skipped straight through and given away to the opponent that I didn't have anything. Whereas setting stops here... You know, there's a chance that they don't attack because they saw Seal Away the last game that we played. You know, again, I'm pretty sure they will attack, but there's no downside to doing this, really. And this is one thing you need to be wary of. Oh, wow, the bluff worked. Sick. Okay, nice. But yeah, this is one thing you need to be wary of. Okay, so Tessin Champion is nice because it gives us a way to bridge the gap between now and playing Showdown of the Scalds. But yeah, like I was saying... If you don't have anything to play, it's almost always going into full. It's almost worth going. It's almost all. Sorry, it's almost always worth going into full control or setting stops, so that it just doesn't give information away. Because good players always recognise when arena is just passing straight through when you don't have anything. So always be wary. If you don't have anything to play and you want to bluff having something, always just go into full control mode or set stops so you're not leaking information. Okay. So that's pretty scary. I was going to say we're really far behind, but drawing a baffling in there is huge. Uh, and we can also play around Spell Pierce here, which is great. So we're definitely going to play Baffling End here. Hopefully they don't have Slip out the back. Thankfully we can play around Spell Pierce. And again, I'm going to set stops here just to bluff having Seal away. Okay, nice. So we get to kill the Spirit Dancer here. And the other great thing about bluffing here is that we're running a deck that doesn't typically run any instant speed interaction. So from the opponent's side, if they don't consider that we're bluffing, it kind of tells them that we have seal away when we don't, if that makes sense. So, I mean, there's a chance they don't attack again here because they thought we had seal away last time. Oh, wow, okay, they attack. I mean, that could mean that they have spell pierce because now we can't pay for it. Or it could also mean that they just can't risk sitting back and not attacking. Okay, so I'm pretty sure they don't have Spell Pierce because I think they would have countered the showdown there. Wow, we hit Baffling End. Okay, that's pretty sick. We do want to play Kami here, but I don't want to shock a land in because I don't want to take unnecessary damage, especially because they already have a Flyer. You know, Auras can very easily get a crazy amount of damage in play out of nowhere. And shocking lands in when you don't need to is is really risky. Okay, second baffling end is sick. But yeah, had we shocked in the land there, they could very easily get SRAM up to a 12 power creature and kill. And so the difference between shocking a land and not shocking, shocking a land in there can mean the difference between surviving an extra turn and not. Okay, they gave for Lurus. So that's a good sign, I think. We'll see what they play here. Thankfully, because baffling end exiles, they can't... Um, bring back Spirit Dancer, which is pretty huge. Okay, so they play Curious Obsession on SRAM. Wow, okay, nothing else. Interesting. So that makes me think they must have some kind of protection spell or spell piss, or I feel like they would have put more auras on. I guess because they know we have Baffling End, maybe they don't want to. We'll see here. So I definitely think we're going to play the first Baffling End on the SRAM, because that's currently the biggest pressing threat. And because Baffling End exiles, they can't just get SRAM or Spirit Dancer back. You know, if we were using Distraction Effects and they didn't have a Selfless Saviour, you kind of have to kill the Lurus first because they can just bring back the SRAM or Spirit Dancer with the Lurus. Wow, they don't have a Protection Spell. Interesting. So, also, we obviously would have liked to have played Cameo of Transients first in order to start putting more counters on it, but... Resolving these baffling ends is by far the most important thing, and if we play Cami of Transients first, we can't play around Spell Pierce with the second baffling end here. Okay, nice, we got there. But yeah, playing around Spell Pierce there was much more important than getting counters on the Cami. So we want to bring Seal away in here, definitely. Um, Arnie Slays the Troll is a consideration, but I think their creatures outscale the fight effect too quickly, and then in terms of cuts, I think we can cut a couple of camis and that's fine. And Showdown of the Scalds, while it did help us find removal there, is not a card that we want to be drawing in multiples here. And it's kind of a late game card where I feel like this matchup is decided pretty early on whether we can either outrace them, like if they have a slow start and we can set up our big creatures, or if we have removal. 
So typically, especially games two and three, when we have seal away, and we're more likely to be able to draw baffling end or seal away. I like mulliganing quite aggressively to removal. Oh wow, we drew baffling end anyway. I was going to say, this hand has quite a fast start because generous visitor. But we can also play weaver on turn two into showdown, which can dig for removal. So that's why I like keeping this hand. Okay, so Light Pause is probably their most threatening creature. So even though we would love to play Weaver on two, we have to go for Baffling End here while they don't have mana open because they could very well have Spell Pierce or slip out the back in their hand. And so killing their creature now while they have shields down is really important. And then we can just go for Weaver next turn into Showdown to hopefully dig for another piece of removal. So hopefully they don't have another creature. Okay, they have a second Light Pause. That's kind of worst case scenario. I think Light Pause is honestly more scary than Spirit Dancer because it can, it's way more consistent at being able to deal lethal. Okay, I was going to say the Auto Tapper gave away they don't have Spell Pierce in hand, which is nice info for us. But, I mean, that doesn't really matter if they can just make Sp uh, Light Pause really big. So huh, we've got a few options here. So I think we definitely want to play Sanctum Weaver. We could play Generous Visitor to play around the Sentinel tax, but I think it's more important to play Hardened Scales here so that Weaver is tapping for more mana next turn. Now unfortunately that does mean that we have to give them a card off the Sentinel draw, but I think it's more important to be able to... You know, if we play Scales first here, that means that Weaver is immediately tapping for three mana instead of two, which could be the difference between being able to dig for and cast Baffling End the next turn, because next turn we want to play Showdown. And so we want Weaver to be tapping for as much mana as possible to maximize our chances of finding Baffling End or Seal Away and being able to cast it as well, if that makes sense. So even though it's not great to give them a card there, I feel like making Weaver tap for more mana is more important, but we'll see. It might not end up working out. Especially if the card that we gave them is like a protection spell or like a key aura that they need to win. <clears throat> but I think doing it this way maximizes our chances. Okay, Staggering Insight is scary because that means they can get either All That Glitters or Aether Tunnel. Okay, they go for All That Glitters so it's a 10-10 now. That's pretty scary. Hopefully they don't have anything else. As long as they don't give it flying or unblockable, I think we've got a fair chance here because we do have a lot of looks. Although they have got, they've given it vigilance, which means that seal away no longer works. Okay, we might just be dead here then because they can get uh, arcane flight. Yeah, and they'll, all they need now is one more aura and they win. Okay, that was a bit unfortunate. So we did have a piece of interaction, but they had the second light pause. Had we been on the play, I think that game would have been a little bit different because we could have got Weaver down before and had a lot more mana. But, you know, this is why this matchup is tough because it very much comes down to how fast their hand is, whether we can set up our sort of end game. And also, uh, a lot of the matchups just come down to whether we draw more baffling ends and seal aways than they have creatures. Okay, so we're going first here and. Ha. Huh. I think I'm going to have to mull for removal here. Okay, nice. We, so we've got two pieces of interaction here, which is really good. Just trying to think what we're going to put back here. Probably a showdown because, you know, that's we don't have any ways to ramp into it. And we already have Sithis and Tessent Champion to generate card advantage. So, so yeah, I think mulling to removal, unless you've got a really fast hand, is, is important in this matchup. Because, like I said, this whole matchup just comes down to whether you can run them out of creatures or not. Okay, so Sentinel on turn one. Wow, okay, Weaver's nice here. I think we play Weaver on two here. And then that does unlock a decent amount of mana for next turn. So we could play Sithis into Baffling End or Sithis into Seal Away if they attack with the Sentinel here. Oh, okay. Helios Punishment on the Weaver is pretty bad. Okay. I was going to say it's pretty bad if we don't draw a land for the turn and we miss the land, which really sucks, but... We'll get Sithis in here, and then that will hopefully guarantee a land for next turn. But yeah, them shutting off that Weaver was pretty bad. I mean, it, it was really compounded by the fact that we didn't draw our land for turn as well. Had we drawn our land for the turn, I think we would have been in a much better spot. Okay, so they're staggering in sight on the Sentinel, so that implies to me that they might not have another creature, like another two mana creature. So unfortunately I think we have to seal away here. Like we want to use seal away over Baffling End because it's much more conditional. Baffling End is definitely the better card in the matchup and I feel like we also have to 
play something to try and hit our third land here. Oh wow, we miss our third land again, and that does draw them two cards off the Sentinel. So missing land drops again is really painful. Had we had we hit our land drop, we could have sealed away and paid one of the Sentinel taxes to draw them one fewer card. So missing land drops here might just do us in. Okay, so they do have SRAM. Well, they don't have anything else, but we did miss land drop again. I mean, we are getting close to unlocking the Sanctum Weaver here. Obviously, we could baffling in, but I'm pretty certain they have a counter spell or protection spell here because they would have played some auras otherwise. Like the fact they're not putting any auras on the SRAM kind of just gives it away that they have some kind of protection here. So I think if we can, I would like to wait until we can start generating mana with Weaver. Because getting our Baffling End countered by Spell Pierce here is kind of a disaster. Okay, wow, so they don't have any... Yeah, they must have protection in hand, otherwise they would just be playing more auras. Okay, we hit a land drop finally. So... Again, I just don't know if it's safe to play Baffling End, so I'm just going to place a Testament Champion here, and then... Hopefully we draw another land next turn because I, I want to at least play around Spell Pierce or you know if they put a ton of auras on SRAM then we obviously force the baffling in but until then I want to play around Spell Pierce. Wow they just put Luris into like the only thing I can think of is that they just have a bunch of protection spells in hand that's the only thing that makes sense from how they're playing. Thankfully we now have Weaver online so we can now play around Spell Pierce which is pretty huge. Now again they could have Slip out the back but there's no way for us to play around that. So I think now that we have access to the Weaver, like we've been very fortunate this game that they've had a slow hand. So we can afford to pay the Sentinel tax here, and I think we probably should. So I think we should probably pay the Sentinel tax, and we can still pay for Spell Pierce as well if they have it with the Sanctum Weaver. Now that does shut us off playing showdown this turn but I think in a way we're more interested in getting the second weaver into play because then that unlocks okay they did have slip out the back that yeah we kind of assumed they would now we can play another weaver which unlocks a ton of mana for the following turn which is really important so I think we'll lead on playing a land first here then we have what five mana so we can play Kami generous visitor and sanctum weaver here which is pretty sick and then since they've had a very slow start, we're kind of, you know, we're we're going to have bigger creatures than they are much quicker now. So, so we get the Sanctum Weaver into play, then we have access to Showdown for next turn. We have a bunch of creatures to block, so we can actually start applying pressure here, I think. They've phased out their SRAM so they can't block with it, so we can attack him with everything. And now, yeah, I don't know what, they, they must have just had a handful of Spell Pierce and Slip out the back. I can't think of any other reason for them not committing more to the board early. Okay, so they put... Wow, they heal to punish the Tessent Champion. I mean, that's not going to be anywhere near enough here. Because now we can pop off with Kami of Transience. And we have Double Sanctum Weaver as well, which is going to just unlock mana to cast everything that we hit off the showdown. We can just start pumping even more counters into the Kami. I mean, we're almost certain to be winning this turn, but I think we have so much mana, we might as well pay the Sentinel tax here. Okay, we hit it beside you as well. Okay, nice. So now we can play the Generous Visitors, and then we can play the Sanctum Weaver to put even more counters on the Kami of Transience. So yeah, I'm pretty sure we're just winning this turn now. We get to play another Generous Visitor here. And then we can play Weaver. And now our Kami of Transience is just going to be so big that we can just trample over for lethal here, I'm pretty sure. Even with Luris giving them lifelink. So the Kami of Transience here, well, what will they go up to? So that's 15 power on the Kami's alone. Yeah, okay, nice. Okay, so we're going first here. And ha, I can't keep a one lander, unfortunately. This looks pretty decent though, we've got Sithis and Sanctum Weaver, just trying to think what we want to put back here. I think I like keeping the three lands, and I'm probably going to put back the Kami here because we've already got two two drops, I don't think we want a third one. We, and you know, Generous Visitor on one, into Weaver on turn two, or I guess since we only have one enchantment, there's definitely an argument to playing Sithis on turn two instead here because 
if you play Weaver first and then Citus and you just don't draw another enchantment, you kind of run out of gas at that point. So I could definitely, you know, if we don't draw another enchantment by the time we're making that decision, I think we're more incentivized to play Citus on turn two. But yeah, if we have other enchantments in hand, getting Weaver into play as soon as possible is generally a good idea. But the downside of Weaver is if you have it and you don't have any ways to refuel, like you don't have a Sithis or a Tessent Champion or a Showdown of the Skulls, you can be left in a spot where you have a lot of mana but nothing to spend it on. Although having said that, Gigantha definitely helps mitigate that to a certain degree because you can just put Gigantha in hand and cast it, which is pretty nice. So we'll obviously lead on the Generous Visitor here. And then, you know, we'll obviously have to see what we draw next turn. If we draw an enchantment, maybe we play Weaver. Okay, then into Unholy Heat. So, oh wow, okay, we drew Kami, interesting. So, so I think since we've drawn Kami, I think I'm actually, I, I think I prefer playing Kami on turn two here because if they have another Unholy Heat, that will kill the Kami. Then we can play Citus or Sanctum Weaver, and if they kill that, then we get the Kami back. And if they don't have Unholy Heat here, which they don't. Okay, so we're against red black mid range by the looks of things. Since we drew a second Sithis, that makes the decision pretty easy here. We're just going to play the first one. And since they didn't have Unholy Heat here, now Kami of Transients has outgrown Holy Heat, which is really nice. Now it is a bit scary if they go Fatal Push on the Kami and then attack. Because then we don't really want to block and they get a free card. But Season Pyromancer uh, discarding two lands. I mean, I'm very happy to see that. That's pretty good. Okay, Showdown is very nice in this matchup as well. We're going to obviously play the Weaver here because we didn't draw our land for turn. I'm going to tap the Sacred Foundry first just in case we draw a green spell that we want to cast, which is much more likely because all of the one drops in our deck are green. So, so unfortunately we didn't draw a land here, but having a second showdown of the Skelds is really important. If they don't kill the Weaver here, we get to showdown of the Skelds next turn, even if we do miss our land drop. So the Inquisition away is Sithis. Let's see what else they've got here. Okay, they just passed, so we just get to resolve Showdown here, which is huge. Like, getting to resolve Showdown against Rakdos is really difficult for them to beat. Wow, they just concede, okay. So it looks like they had a pretty awkward start compared to what we had. So this is definitely a matchup where we want Shape of Sanctuary, and I think we're just going to trim Kami in this matchup. Um, I'm not really sure we want anything else here, honestly. Shape of Sanctuary is very, very good against their deck, because we have a lot of muscle threats. Sithis, Sanctum, Weaver's Tessent Champion... Even Kami and Generous Visitor are all kind of must kill threats, and their only way of interacting with us is with uh, targeted removal, and Shape of Sanctuary is just sick against that. Ha, so we don't have any white mana, which is an issue. This is a potential. I mean, hmm. We can go Shape of Sanctuary on one into Tessent Champion on three, which I think is fine, even if we don't draw a white land. So I'm willing to. This is definitely a risky keep, but I'm willing to try it and just hope that we draw a white land in the first few turns. Maybe this is risky. I think it's close to a mile, but... Ha, huh, drawing more white cards isn't exactly what we want to see here, but... I mean, playing Successant Champion with a Shape of Sanctuary out is pretty nice. Okay, they feed this from the Shape of Sanctuary. I mean, that's a removal spell they're not going to be using on one of our other creatures, so that's not the end of the world, I guess. Now we play Tessent Champion, and that is actually quite difficult for them to deal with because it dodges Unholy Heat until they have Delirium, and they need a way to trigger a Vault to kill it with Fatal Push as well, so it's kind of a good thing that they use that Feed the Swarm. Actually, no, I don't know. If they hadn't used Feed the Swarm on Shape of Sanctuary, they'd have had to use it on the Champion anyway, which would have drawn us a card, so... Okay, so they Inquisition us, and they have Fable as well. So, I mean, we really just need to draw either an enchantment to trigger the Stessant Champion or a white land. A white land would be ideal here because then we could just play Showdown. Oh, well, perfect. So they take the Stessant Champion because we don't have white mana. Now we drew the white mana and we get to go for Showdown here. Let's see what we hit. Wow, okay. Double Kami, that's pretty nice. So I think we're going to not attack here because we want to be able to stop this 2 2 getting in for a free treasure token. Wow, they choose not to loot with Fable, so they must have a pretty good hand. Okay, so we're definitely going to block here. The only reason they would attack is either to get more mana or to trigger Fatal Push. And even if they have Fatal Push, yeah, even if we hadn't blocked there, they could have just sacked the treasure to trigger Revolt, so... Okay, they have Thoughtseize as well. Probably going to take the Sithis, I imagine, here. Or they could take the Baffling End if they want to stop us from killing the Reflection of Kiki Jiki. 
but I imagine they take Sith. It's interesting, okay. So they take the Baffling End, which makes me think they have a creature they want to copy with Reflection, which is probably either like a Glory Bringer or most likely a Seasoned Pyromancer, because getting to copy Seasoned Pyromancer with Reflection is a pretty sick late game. How they're thinking about something. I think they must have a removal spell here. But for them to take Baffling End instead of Sithis, I mean, I get that we don't have any other enchantments yet, so we can't even really make good use of Sithis as things stand, but they obviously value this reflection pretty highly. So it'd be interesting to see what their last card is. Okay, so they, ha they had something, but they didn't end up using it. Interesting. Okay, so now they have the reflection, which is pretty scary. Because there are a number of decent cards. They could also have Blood Tithe Harvester, I guess, as a way to start killing our creatures, which is another good card they can copy with Reflection. Okay, so they did have Fatal Push. Oh, okay, I guess they didn't have Black Mana and they didn't want to sack a treasure just to use Fatal Push. That makes sense. Okay, double Fatal Push. And Season... Okay, so they did have the Season Pyromancer, so that makes sense now why they took the Baffling End. Ha, ah, okay. So this is not great now, because they can start copying the Season Pyromancer to draw two every turn. Hmm. I think they're pretty incentivized to kill Sithis here, because we have so many good top decks that can just chain together a bunch of draws. So I'm just going to put Giganther in hand. You know, you could have potentially cast the second Sithis out there, but I think that's a really big waste. And they're already pretty incentivized to use a removal spell on the Sithis anyway. And we get both Kami's back because the showdown sacked itself for Chapter 3, which is really nice. Okay, yeah, so they did use a removal spell. I mean, even though they're gonna... Wow, and a Molten Impact. Okay, that's a bit rough. But yeah, even though they're gonna... Thankfully, they don't have enough mana to get two cards off the Season Pyromancer this turn, but... Interesting. So I think we're gonna play both Kami's and play Sithis here. And then we can, you know, we have Giganthra as backup and we can start getting aggressive potentially as well. They can obviously copy the Season Pyromancer here to keep drawing. Wow, okay, they have Unholy Heat, that's a bit rough. Maybe, hmm, maybe I misplayed that slightly. Maybe it's better to go Gigantha and wait to play Sithis until we have another enchantment to play to get value off it immediately, but then... Actually, yeah, maybe that was a better play. I'm not really sure. It's close. Okay, so they obviously attack with the token because they're going to lose it anyway. So there's no real danger for blocking here. If they have on Holy Heat, they could have killed the other Kami anyway. Interesting. So I think we can afford to attack here because we have Gigantha. Their only real way of killing it is probably going to be Feed the Swarm, I imagine. And they've already used two copies of that. Uh, I'm going to set stops during the opponent's turn just to bluff interaction here. But yeah... I, unless they can get Unholy Heat online, like Delirium online for Unholy Heat, they're going to have a hard time beating Gigantha here, which allows us to get aggressive with our Kamis. And if we do draw enchantments, we can buff the Kamis to 4-4s, four which makes it even more difficult for them to beat. Oh wow, they just, I mean, that didn't feel like it was over, but I'll take the win. Okay, so we're going second here. And yeah, this one looks pretty decent. You know, we've got either Generous Visitor or Kami on turn 1, we've got Sithis and Stess and Champion, and we've got some interaction as well, so pretty balanced hand here. Okay, Dragon's Rage Channel, so probably against Phoenix here, so ha. Huh. Had we drawn our third land here, I think I would have gone for Kami on turn 1. Since we didn't draw our third land here, I think going for Kami is a bit of a waste because if we don't draw our third land next turn, there's no real bonus for going for Kami here. And we could potentially start boosting the power of Generous Visitor by playing Sithis or Baffling End. Ha, uh, oh wow. So they bounce the Generous Visitor and they mill over a Phoenix, which is pretty rough. Okay, so we did draw our third land on turn, so had I known that was on top of the deck, I probably would have gone for Kami last turn instead. Here, I think we definitely want to go for Baffling End here because they've already got a Phoenix in Graveyard and Dragon's Rage Channeler makes it so much easier to chain three spells together to get back Phoenix. Additionally, playing Stithis out is also probably actively bad there because it gives it a target for their Unholy Heat. So say, for example, they had like a Consider, an Opt and an Unholy Heat. Since we don't have a creature in play, 
that they can't chain three spells together because they don't have a target front holy heat. So I prefer playing Baffling in there because if we play Sithis, it's much easier for them to bring back Phoenix from the graveyard. Going to play Champion here because they don't have Delirium, so on holy heat isn't going to be able to kill it. And if it does survive, we can start popping off next turn, getting a bunch of counters. Wow, is that three Phoenixes? Okay, I mean, if they can chain three spells together here, I very much doubt we're going to be able to beat three phoenixes here. This is exactly why... Okay, so they did have three spells. It's not completely over yet, but I imagine we're losing this game. Yeah, this right here is exactly why I run four rest in peace in this sideboard, because this is the main way we get we lose. We're not 100% dead yet, because we can play Sithis and potentially chain... Kami into another one mana green enchantment. If we hit another Kami or a hardened scales off this Kami, then we can put ourselves to 10 life. We're not, we're not immediately dead and there's an outside chance, especially if we hit hardened scales here, that we could potentially attack back the following turn, but we'd have to get very lucky. Okay, we didn't get there, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, rest in peace really helps in this matchup because fast phoenixes are the main way we lose. We have a pretty good time against the rest of their creatures, just Arc Light Phoenix specifically is a bit rough. So we want to see the way as well. I prefer to see the way to Baffling End in this matchup because it deals with bigger creatures like Phoenix, Crackling Drake, etc. I like Trimming Showdown because, you know, we don't want too much top end. We want to be able to interact early on. Kami, I don't think is that important. And as you saw last game, if you don't have your third land on time, it's not that great. Baffling End seems reasonable though because a lot of the Phoenix decks are more focused on cheaper creatures now. They've got Ledger Shredder, DRC, you know, there aren't as many Storming Entities and Cracking Jakes running about now. Oh wait, hold on a second. Did I just submit a 61 card deck? I just saw out the corner of my eye 61. I hope not. Well, I mean, it shouldn't make too much of a difference if I did. I just need to board out to 60 if I did next game. So we got 50. Yeah, okay, whoops. <laughs> I accidentally submitted a 61 card deck, but we'll just make a trim going into game, well, if we get to game 3, that is. But yeah, that was a bit stupid. I think if I had to cut one more card, it would probably be another showdown. But yeah, this hand is nice. We've got double rest in peace, so even if they have a spell pierce, we get to resolve the rest in peace. So just trying to debate whether we want to play scales on turn 1 here. Probably not, because we want to use the scales to trigger the Kami. You know, ideally we would like to play Rest in Peace on turn 2 here. Thankfully they didn't play an untap blue, so there's no spell pierce. And now if they tap out we can go Kami into scales, or we could go Setessant Champion. Kami into scales puts Kami out of reach of Unholy Heat. Okay, they do have Symmetry Sage, which is a little bit scary. So we could play Setessant Champion which I think is probably the best play here. That's the highest upside. Going Kami into scales is nice, but we want to take advantage of the card advantage we're going to get off champion. And we also want to grow champion as quickly as possible, because if they have double unholy heat, that is a way they can deal with champion. Okay, nice. So it doesn't let it do. And out of the two cards, I think we want champion to stick around longer, because getting a bunch of card advantage is generally more useful than just raw power in this matchup. Okay, nice. So we get to grow this Tessant Champion here, which is huge. Wow, Seal Away is a nice draw. So I'm going to lead on the Scales here, because Scales, there's a nice interaction with Tessant Champion where you'll immediately get 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters on the Champion. Uh, then we can Seal Away here while this, the Symmetry Sage is tapped. Okay, nice. We draw our land for turn, which is important. Then we can play Generous Visitor. And now Tessant Champion is already a 5 power creature, and it has 7 toughness, so... I mean, they're not going to get Delirium with Rest in Peace anyway, but if we didn't have Rest in Peace, they couldn't even kill it with a Delirium on Holy Heat here, which is huge. Okay, they got Channeler here. So I think we'll just go Kami and Rest in Peace. Then we get counters on both the Kami, the Visitor, and the Stessant Champion, and since we have Hardened Scales in play, it doubles them all up as well, which is nice. I'm going to target the Visitor for the counters just to try and incentivize them to use on Holy Heat now if they have it. Wow, they don't, okay. So even though rest, the second copy of Rest in Peace doesn't do much, I mean, it does protect us against uh, Brazen Borrower, but we get triggers off Visitor, Kami, and Stessant Champion. So even though typically decks don't really like drawing the second copy of Rest in Peace, we're actually taking good advantage of it here. Okay, so they have Aether Gust as a well to do, way to deal with Champion. I think I'm pretty happy just putting that on top, to be honest. 
because with two enchantments in hand, we're just going to get value off it immediately. Well, not immediately, but it's better than just a random card off the deck, off the top of the deck, I think. And again, you know, it gives us the inevitability. All they've got in the play at the moment is a channeler that's never going to hit Delirium because we have Rest in Peace in play, so we will definitely have the inevitability if we can resolve this Tessin Champion again. Okay, so they shock a Steam Vent Sins. They must have something... Okay, they've got a Braid. I mean, I'm kind of happy for them to use a Braid on the Visitor when they could have used it on the Champion, but again, I guess they're they're pretty much on the back foot. They would be staring down 7 damage if they didn't kill the, the Visitor there, so... So we'll attack him with the Kami again. Puts them down to 6 if they don't block here. see what else they've got. Okay, they've got Shredder and Consider. So Shredder, you know, is a decent threat, but they're not going to be able to outrace, like, the Kami or anything here, really, so I'm not too worried about it. The main thing I would be worried about is something like a Crackling Drake, but we have double seal away, so that's not really much of an issue, to be honest. Okay, and they do have Symmetry Sage, so they do have a decent number of other creatures, but we have hardened scales in play. We can just play Kami and the second rest in peace here. It does trigger the Shredder, but we get to put two counters on everything because of the hardened scales. And even though they have a bunch of creatures here, they're really on the back foot. They're super far behind on life total and tempo here. And since they've only got four power in play, I think we can afford to attack with both creatures here. You know, they could obviously uh, just chump the Kami and block with the Ledger Shredder like, hey, like they are, but that's fine because we're forcing through three damage there anyway. We're not we can't block in the air. They're not going to attack with the channeler anyway, so. So yeah, I'm pretty sure we're gonna win this game unless they have something really unexpected here. Okay, so they have braid the champion. That probably means they have unholy heat as well, I'd imagine. Or like a pillar of flame. But even then, we've got ten power in play already, and they've only got what? seven toughness so yeah they do have the unholy heat but we should still wait oh no they have eight toughness so they can survive at one assuming we don't have any other enchantments but we obviously do we can just play Sithis and seal away and just yeah okay nice so that matchup was so much better because we got rest in peace had they had phoenixes in the graveyard that would have been rough okay yeah so we did have a 61 card deck so just going to trim a showdown yeah, that was stupid. I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know why. I just didn't clock that we had sixty-one there. <clears throat> but yeah, as you can see, shutting off the graveyard makes this matchup so much easier. Which is why I think running four rest in peace in the sideboard is is really important because that rest in peace is a very polarizing card in this matchup. We have very good tools to be able to deal with their creature game plan because it is a little bit slower. It has more points of interaction. Whereas Phoenix, even though we bring in Seal away, which is a potential answer. Just being able to shut off that, plus Unholy Heat only dealing 2 damage means that it's very difficult for them to deal with our Tessent Champion, Visitor and Kami once they start growing past 2 toughness. Ha. Huh. So I'm not sure about this hand because we don't have White Mana for Baffling End, which is a very important card, but we could risk it. I don't know, probably not worth it. Plus, yeah, we, I was going to say plus we kind of want to mull to a Rest in Peace if we don't have a great hand. and. We've got one here. Putting one back could be problematic if they have a spell pierce, but I think it's uh, kind of too much of a risk to keep two and put back a Baffling End or a Sithis. Wow, they don't have their second land. That's rough for them. So even though typically we would love to get Sithis in play here, they could very well have an Hoo Heat, and I think getting rest in, place in, rest in Peace in play before they drew like a spell pierce is very important. Oh wow, they just kept a one land and was punished. Oh well, I'll take it. Nice.